Today we are in week four of the series, You Asked For It, which is the series where we've collected questions from you this last month and put that together into um, a way for us to approach those questions and different topics. And today's question comes actually from a young person. Last month I took the opportunity in one of the classes to pass out some papers and have them write down what questions do you guys have that you like to maybe participate in or share in with this um, series. And we got back some responses, and as Dev and I will look through those, from the youth responses, there was one that showed up about two or three times, at least three times, in the, uh, from the youth questionnaire, and you asked for it. And that was this question right here. How do I deal with my fear and anxiety? That was a question that, that came from the young people. Um, so I thought it was appropriate today, being a youth Sunday, this is the question that we will tackle as part of this series today, and looking at how do we deal with fear and anxiety? Let me first say, this is not just a question for young people, as all of us adults know. Fear and anxiety is a reality within our lives. And it is very evident within the world that we live in and the challenges that we can face. It doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are, how young you feel, fear and anxiety will still creep into life and sometimes become crippling within life. So how do we deal with that? But as I consider this from the youth perspective and the youth culture, I recognize that there are many things that have swelled up and have become so dominant in their experiences that can easily lead to fear and anxiety within their lives. I was given a book not too long ago, just recently. Um, It was about um, how to handle violence in schools. And it talked about uh, the uprise of violence in schools and approaching this and dealing with that. And as I look... The book over, then I was surprised to look at the publication date, and it was 1995 that a book was written about the uprising of violence in schools. And here we are in 2018, and we see that as a prevalent topic um, within our youth culture as well. It's no wonder there is so much fear and anxiety, or that there is reason for fear and anxiety. I just this last week asked a group of middle school students to write down some of what is their fears and anxieties, since we know we were going with this theme. So what are some fears and anxieties that you have? Listen to some of these responses. You might, I'm sure you will probably connect with them as well. From middle school students. Not being able to impress people. I'm scared I won't be able to do all the things I want before I die. Being a disappointment. Failing. I think that's one we can all connect with, just the fear of failing. Not being perfect for someone who expects me to be, not fitting in. Homework not being done. Of course, coming from a student, but in life, there's always homework. It never ends. I'm sorry, kids. I want to follow my dream, but some people say I can't. Making the right decision. I find hope in that one listed Well, you find a little fear and anxiety in making the right decision. I'm glad the student wants to make the right decision. Or just simply passing a test. Now, these are a lot of fears and anxieties have to deal with the expectations of other people um, pushed upon them. Fears and anxieties, they come in all different ways. There's silly fears that we sometimes face. I know for me, and maybe I've shared this before, um, I've somewhat have overcome it, but as a kid, for some reason, I always had a fear of large dogs. I never had an incident that happened in my life to justify that, but I was always just very timid about large dogs and approaching large dogs or um, just feeling safe or comfortable around large dogs. In college, as I was traveling with a, with a group, we would stay in people's homes. And I remember specifically one morning, we stayed in this person's home, and the other students that stayed with me, they knew about my fear of large dogs. So they decided to wake me up that morning with the host's Great Dane. (laughs) Brought him into the room and pretty much got him on the bed over the top of me. Oh, that's a morning I'll never forget. (laughs) The Great Dane right there with his loud bark that you could just feel right through your chest. Sometimes we have these silly little fears, these fears that just we hang on to, whatever else. But then there are some fears and anxieties that are so real, that are so prevalent, and sometimes can be so crippling within life. Fears such as just fulfilling daily needs, job concerns, family concerns, health concerns, and so many others. We don't even have to go look for them. They find us. 
we don't have to look for these. They will come find us with different ways to be afraid or anxious about things. You know, the media, it force feeds us fear because fear sells. And it's there in front of our face at all times. So what do we do with this? How do we approach this? The message today will take us into some scripture. We'll really be driven by the application of that scripture because we're asking this question, how do we deal with this? What do we do with it? Fear and anxiety is not absent in scripture. We can't think if we look to the Bible and everything's, everything that happened within there was perfect for their lives as it went on. We actually find stories throughout Scripture, of people dealing with fear and anxiety. Some that we can use as great examples of what to do, and some we can use as examples of what not to do. This week in your life groups, you have the opportunity to dig into one uh, story that comes out of the New Testament. This morning, I want to dig into a story that comes out of the Old Testament, one that's very familiar to us, and one that uh, I'm sure you've heard many times before, but it comes out of 1 Samuel 17, and we'll be... um, Looking at some passages there in that, that story of 1 Samuel 17, 1 Samuel 17 is the story of David and Goliath. When we think of David and Goliath, you might first off think, well, that's a kid's story. Well, yes, quite often we use this story in the kids' settings to teach a lesson, but it's not a kid's story at all. There's a lot in there that we can learn from. And as you maybe have heard this story so many times, I pray that you, just as I have, just this uh, beginning of this month, Um, was studying this or or hearing this again, pulling out something new from it, a new piece of wisdom or insight, because that's what God's Word is. It's alive and breathing. It's active. So as we look at the story again today, I pray that you might pull something else out that's new as we come down to an application of dealing with fear and anxiety. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, the setting starts off, it gives us a setting right there in verse 1, that the Philistines had now mustered their army for battle, and they had camped on one side of the valley, and the Israelites had camped on the other side of the valley, with Saul's had gathered his Israelite army there. So the Philistines and the Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valley between them. I can only picture this in my mind, what it might have looked like. We have one giant army, another giant army, and then just this valley in between. Talk about an area of anxiety. That valley had to be an intense area of anxiety and fear, almost like a dense fog just hovering over it. And that is the, the scenario, the, of the, uh, the setting that the story begins with. And then enters the thing that really brings anxiety to them, and that is the giant. Verse 4, Then Goliath, a Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall, He wore a bronze helmet, and his bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore bronze leg armor and carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as the weaver's beam, tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him, carrying a shield. So try to imagine what this person would be like. I'll give you this image on the screen here of a Goliath. Now, where I place this image from this stage floor here up to about where he is, would be about the height of what a Goliath would have been. You know, just over nine and a half feet. I am not a very tall person. Most students exceed my height by the time they're in eighth or ninth grade out of middle school, coming into high school. But I know if I encountered him, and of course you have to imagine the rest of his body here, um, that it would be absolutely intimidating, like meeting a Great Dane. This would be... Very intimidating. And Goliath comes out, and he's, in verse 8, he stood and he shouted a taunt across the Israelites, Why are you all coming out to fight? He called, I'm the Philistine champion. But you were only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. And then he says this, very pointed words, I defy the armies of Israel today. Send a man who will fight me. And when Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Rightfully so, probably. They see this guy who is taunting them. And we're talking about grown adults being scared and afraid. I said, this is not just necessarily a kid's story. 
This is a story about scared adults, frightened adults, anxious adults. And it becomes challenging to them. And reading on, verse 12, David, the son of a man named Jesse, from Bethlehem, the land of Judah, Jesse was an old man at the time, and he had eight sons. Jesse's three oldest sons, and these names actually are going to be important, Eliab, Abinadab, and Shimea, had already joined Saul's army to fight the Philistines. David was the youngest son. David's three oldest brothers stayed with Saul's army, but David went back and forth so he could help his father with the sheep in Bethlehem. Verse 16 tells us this, For forty days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champion strutted, strutted in front of the Israelite army. See, this just wasn't a one-time thing where Goliath comes out and challenges them. This has been going on for 40 days. For 40 days, he has shut down the Israelite army in fear and anxiety. I find it interesting, quite oftentimes we find the, the number 40 throughout Scripture and in 40 days, there's something good not happening there or something challenging happening. And this is this scenario right here. 40 days, he's coming out and just taunting them and they are shutting down. But these are grown men. These are mighty warriors. These are people who shouldn't be shut down. But this giant has done that to them. You know, we're introduced to who these people are. Saul and the Israelite army, to some of them. Earlier in uh, the book of 1 Samuel. In fact, in 1 Samuel 9, we first introduced to Saul, the king, who is scared to death here. But in chapter 9, we, we meet him. And the, the words that are, that are used to describe him in verse 2, it says, Saul was the most handsome man in Israel, head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. Don't forget that Saul was not just some short guy. He was a big guy. Head and shoulders taller than the rest of the people around him. Before Goliath came along, they saw Saul. And they were in awe of Saul. But now Saul is challenged by this Goliath. And we also get to know some of these Israelite soldiers. In fact, specifically, Specifically, these three brothers are mentioned just a chapter earlier in 1 Samuel chapter 16, when the prophet Samuel goes to, to Jesse's house to anoint a new upcoming king, he approaches first Eliab in verse 6. When they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely this is the Lord's anointed. That means when he saw Eliab, he was inspired by him. He thought, boy, this guy right here, he has the ability to become the king. That's what he, his appearance alone showed that. But God said, no, not him. And Samuel then, before him was brought, Jesse had his son, Abinadab, to step forward and walk in front of him. And God said, no. And then Shemia is also mentioned right there in, in verse six, or sixteen or chapter 16, that he also stepped before him. He's like, is this guy be the guy? And, and God said, no. So these guys, these soldiers, were not wimpy guys. They were guys with might and power. They should have been able to stand up against whatever faced them, but something has shut them down. You know, at one time, I'm sure they were very proud of themselves and other King Saul, you know, bragging about how awesome they are, how good they are, that nothing could be able to, to really challenge them. I almost wonder that if, if, if the Israelites' army had trading cards. You know, digital media has replaced that a lot, but trading cards with the different soldiers and stuff on it. If King Saul had his own trading card... I think it would look something like this, and I'll put a, a script, uh, picture of it up there. A King uh, Saul with his armor looking almighty, and then on the back of his trading card, some of the stats of King Saul, and that is chosen by God, empowered to lead, purpose for good, and highly valued. And throughout, throughout the, the time so far, this army has felt really good about themselves and who they are and what they can do and what they can accomplish. They had trading cards. They might be trading around. I'm just going to put this one back here, up on this stand right here. And King Saul was someone they looked to and admired. And each one of them had abilities and strength, yet something was completely shutting them down and crippling them for 40 days. This anxiety and fear of the giant. Well, what if the giant had his own trading card? What would that look like? Well, I have a giant trading card up here. It had to be much bigger than just a small card. The giants 
trading card would look something like this, intimidating, scary. And what happens is when this goes right up in front of King Saul's character, it just clouds it out and is unseen. Because now the giant is the main focus and is the biggest uh, challenge that they have in front of them. And it's what they're seeing. There's no comparison between those two cards. The Goliath card is going to win. That is where fear and anxiety really comes into reality. When something dominates over us and is way beyond out of our control, it almost feels like it can overcome us. And then David arrives on the scene of the battle. In 1 Samuel 17, in uh, verse 17, Jesse tells David, hey, go check on your brothers, see how they're doing. Um, he hadn't got any status updates or anything from him for a while, so he sent David off to go check on him and to uh, see how things are going with him. And David, he had left the sheep with some other shepherd in verse 20. And as soon as he arrives, he comes to see what's going on in this valley. That is the standoff between these two armies. In verse 23, it says, He was talking with him. Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. And as soon as the Israelite army saw him, they began to run away in fright. And in verse 25, they exclaimed this, Have you seen the giant? The men asked. He comes out each day to defy Israel. Have you seen the giant? See, the issue was the Israelite army was only seeing the giant. I find it interesting, and we, we passed that scripture, but or we already went through that scripture, but if you had the stats of the giant, <laughs> there's a lot there. That these stats were right in scripture right there. These stats of the giant being a champion, over nine feet tall, his bronze helmet. They knew every detail about this giant. You don't find that interesting? How, why did the army know everything about this giant? Because they see him, and it's almost like they're in awe of him. They're almost in awe of the thing that they're afraid of, the thing that's causing them anxiety and fear, more than they're in awe of the God that they serve. They list all these details of what this giant's like, and they ask, have you seen him? And I want his trading card. He's pretty awesome, but he's terrifying to me. And he has all these, these stats of who the giant is as the primary focus for the Israelite army. And because of that, they are shut down. They're unable to be the people they're supposed to be, the king to be the king that he is supposed to be. But David sees this differently. As David steps into this story, he is able to see past the giant. Not ignore the fact that there's a giant there. You can't ignore that. There's over a nine and a half foot tall guy in the valley yelling at you for 40 days. He's there. But he can see through him to see something even greater. David even exclaims in verse, uh, the end of verse 26, Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to, deny, to defy the armies of the living God? Why are we letting him defy the armies of the living God? And then David says, Don't worry about this Philistine. I'll go fight him. He decides to do something about this. But the reason he can do this is because he sees what's greater and what's beyond this giant, and that is the God that he serves. We really need a God-sized trading card. I don't have one on the stage here. I am sure you could probably order one online, so I'm going to check that out real quick. See if we can find one online here. Giant-sized trading card. Yeah, that's a good one. 20-second delivery, I'll take that. All right, we'll see if that comes on time, see if the delivery service is what they say they are. A giant-sized trading card of God because David is not looking at this giant even though it's overwhelming to him. He is seeing beyond that. He is seeing the power of the God that he serves and how awesome that... Yep, 20 seconds. You guys are awesome. Great delivery service. He sees something beyond... What everyone else is seeing, that is great. You guys are the fastest service I've had online in a long time. So thank you. Thanks for this. You need me to sign for anything? Yes. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Last name's Ernst, by the way, so you got it on there. A giant size trading card of God. And that ends up going up there. Well, that's all you can see. That is what David is looking at. That's what David is envisioning through the giant. Not saying that the giant doesn't exist, that fear and anxiety is not a reality, that my God is greater and that God is even more powerful. And you know the rest of the stories we read in verse 41. Well, Goliath walks out towards David with the shield bearer ahead of him and just yelling in contempt towards the Israelite army and towards David. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick, cursing David by the names of his gods. And then David replied to the Philistine, You come with me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom, I have, whom you have defiled. That he's coming to him with the power of God. And how amazing that is. And through that, as we know the story where David takes them, the, the one stone, puts it into the sling, flings that around, and gets that giant right in the head, brings him down to the ground, and then proclaims victory. Not victory for David. David himself says, this is the Lord's battle. This is the victory for him and who he is. David shows us this, that it is possible, even in the midst of some giant fears, to recognize that there is still something greater beyond that, and that is the God that he serves. He says, the Lord rescued me, is what David's proclamation is. And that's back in verse 37, when he's even having this debate whether he can go fight this giant. He recognizes the Lord who has rescued him from his past experiences, and the Lord will rescue you through this experience as well. There's two little... Uh, he says, I can give you just a couple of quick applications for this. And the first is simply this, and I've kind of said it already, but never forget that God is bigger than the fears and anxieties that you face. Never forget that God is bigger than the fears and anxieties we face. They're real, but yet God is bigger. I like Jeremiah 32, 27. It says, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? God asked that question. The answer is no. I got to draw my confidence then from God, not from my own abilities. Not how big my faith is. It's who my faith is in. And how big my God is. And then the, another application, just I can quickly pull from this. And that is to never let your fears get closer to you than God. Let me show it to you like this. Using this, this giant card, just like the Israelites were so focused upon the giant and all the stats and all the information of the giant, you're just holding this so close to them that it became impossible for them to see God. It also becomes impossible, as I hold this right here, to really see you. I know you're there, unless you slipped out of the room really quick. But I know that you're there, but I can't really see you for who you are through this fear and anxiety that I am clinging to even more then I'm clinging on to who God is because God has his own stats so much greater than the stats of anything else. And these are just a few words that describe who God is that we find in Scripture. That he's good, he's powerful. I love this one. He's there when no one else is. That's what we need when it comes to fear and anxiety. That he's almighty, that he is love, a refuge, protector, that he's merciful. Who God is clinging to that even more so than when we focus our mind and attention upon the things that make us anxious or the things that make us fearful. James 4, 8 says, Come close to God, and God will come, will come close to you. Now, those are just a couple simple little applications. And I know it sounds so um, neat and tidy when we just package it like that, but how does it really apply to real life when challenges come? How does it really apply to the things that do happen in life that become very challenging and difficult. As I was working in this message, someone came to mind that has a victory story. And I contacted her and asked her, hey, would you be willing to share 
um, your, your story with the church today. Many of you have been a part of it, been a part of the experience. So I am inviting uh, Megan to come on up and to share her story of dealing with a pretty major fear and anxiety that she had to deal with and how God has brought victory through that. So I'll let Megan speak in a much better way than I can. Good. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right. <laughs> so, hi, everybody. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Megan Ensing, and Todd has so gracio- graciously asked if I could come today to share my testimony with you. So, um, I've been, been integrated in this church for basically my entire life. Um, I grew up being a part of Todd's youth group. Um, Michael officiated the wedding ceremony for my husband and I, and my whole family since before I was born um, have been involved in um, the church. So um, I currently live in Grand Rapids with my husband, DJ, some know him as Skippy, um, and a very cute chihuahua named Chewy. (laughs) So you may see us around from time to time visiting my family. Um, I have to say when Todd approached me with this, I was honored uh, to be able to share with you all of you how God has truly changed my life. So to start, I want to take you back to a moment that really changed my life forever, um, and that happened about seven years ago. So in April of 2011, I was a sophomore up at Ferris State University pursuing my um, dream job to be a dental hygienist. Um, I was finishing up my semester with finals kind of right around the corner, and I was five exams away from starting my program. On a cold Sunday, I went to the small Big Rapids Hospital because I was having some strange symptoms. Um, I was having some abnormal bruising and other types of symptoms. Um, And when I got there, they ran some blood tests to try to narrow down what was going on. Um, After analyzing the blood test, the ER doctor told me that he thought that my abnormal symptoms were a sign of a type of leukemia. So there I was, 20 years old, waiting for my life to kind of start, and I was hit with a major blow. The rest of the day was kind of a blur for me. Uh, The Big Rapids Hospital was pretty small, so basically they could only tell me what they thought it was, um, but that I had to drive immediately to a hospital that would be able to treat and diagnose me properly. Um, So I chose to go to U of M for treatment. To relay how fast you this process was, uh, that afternoon I was diagnosed with APL, which stands for acute promyelocytic leukemia, with a high risk of relapse. So basically what that meant was that um, my counts were so far off that I could go back into the disease a little um, faster or more easily than others with the same problem. And that night, um, because of that issue, I started my chemotherapy. Even though um, the day was still a little bit of a blur, I do remember one thing. Um, It was the conversation that I had when I met Dr. Bixby, my hematologist that saved my life. And this is his picture. Um, I remember looking at him and asking him, am I going to be okay? Obviously a pretty hard question for him to answer. Um, But I'll always remember what he said to me. I'm going to do whatever I can to make you okay, but just remember, this is going to be a marathon and not a sprint. After that moment, I was placed in patient for 30 days, and that was the moment that started my six-year fight to being cured of this disease. As you can imagine, this experience was not um, an easy one on my family or I. I remember the feeling of being cooped up in a hospital room for 30 days straight while I um, endured chemo treatment to kill all the bad cells, um, followed by infusions to reboot my body with good cells. After 30 days in patient stay, I remember driving two of them every single day for three months straight to sit in a chair to get more infusions and take a handful of pills. I remember getting so sick. Um, I had lost my hair. This is my dad shaving my head and Skippy being pretty excited about his his head getting shaved as well. Um, I lost my hair and I felt like I was losing my mind. Um, But sadly and um, most impactfully, I remember how scary it was to build relationships with people um, that had the same diagnosis as me, but they didn't make it out of the hospital. I had to keep telling myself what Dr. Bixby said. It's a marathon, not a sprint, one day at a time. But among all of the horrible things, I do remember something much more vividly. 
I remember my family, my friends, and people that I have never even met before praying for me, crying with me, and encouraging me to push through one more day at a time. I remember God being right there, and I mean right there, putting his fingerprints in my path at times that I needed them. I experienced my family draw together in ways that I had never seen. I saw cards, literally a wall of cards, <laughs> and a giant Easter basket full of all of these presents <laughs> being delivered to me with encouragement and prayer just for me. I saw inspirational people fighting their lives every single day with a smile on their face, and I knew that that wouldn't ever be possible without God. I saw so many miracles in that hospital, and I know that those experiences were not just a coincidence. I know that Todd had spoken a lot today about anxiety and the effects it has on our lives. You could probably anticipate that when um, I got diagnosed, my mind was flooding with the anxiety um, during that time, as well as um, the time that I was going through treatments. But it's still something that I struggle with today. Because this event happening when it, to me when I was so young, it really gave me a wake-up call that just because I'm 20, it doesn't mean I'm invincible, and that was scary. So now I have this extreme heightened awareness that makes me automatically jump to the worst conclusions, and that's how my anxiety kicks in today. I constantly have to tell myself, a twinge in my elbow does not mean I have elbow cancer. <laughs> I feel that God allows us to endure these challenges for a reason. God showed me this experience, um, in this experience, that I am much stronger than I ever imagined that I would be. When I got cancer, I had two choices. One, to get mad and blame God for the pain that I was enduring. Or two, um, I could really use this experience to show people that God is great regardless of what I was going through. So I decided to choose the latter. When I got cancer, my mindset through the experience was that God had given me this as a gift and he's entrusted me with the responsibility to use this gift to relate to others going through pain to share his glory with them. With this mindset, I feel like this disease has blessed me in ways beyond what I feel like I deserve. Without cancer, I never would have seen all the wonderful things that I described to you earlier and believe that this is what anchored my faith to be able to handle struggles that will continue to come my way through life. Before now, I always thought that that verse in Romans where it talks about rejoicing and suffering was kind of annoying. <laughs> I'm like, God, I'm here struggling big time and you want me to be happy about it? That's practically impossible. Um, but now I think I understand. I was focusing on the first part of the verse, but I didn't let him finish. He says in Romans 5, 3 through 5, that not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Using the foundations of this verse and continuing to use all er other areas of life, like our anxiety and stress, this helps us build the character that we need to be able to change our mindset from focusing on the Goliath in our life that seems so big to focusing on the God that seems so much bigger. Um, this gives us relief to know that God um, says that we can give up control. When we don't need to be in control, we relinquish our anxiety. Like I said, it's not that I don't have problems with anxiety, but because of this experience, it actually caused this to be a barrier that I have to overcome. But this is what I do when I'm anxious. I look backwards, and then I look forwards. I would urge you to do the same thing. Look backwards. Look at what you've done. You've fought some uphill battles, but hope kept coming, right? And God was gracious, and you felt like you were running out of fuel, and you couldn't make it, but you did, right? Strength kept coming, and you kept pushing through, and that was God. Then look forward. Look at all the hope that God has promised us through his word and through prayer. God is always faithful. So just remember again what Dr. Bixby says. It's a marathon, not a sprint, one day at a time. And remember what God says. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. I have been blessed to um, be considered cured from my leukemia. Here's me with Dr. Bixby um, at my cure date appointment last year on September 15th. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I'm so blessed to have an amazing support system along with my God right by my side. 
I want to thank my amazing mom and dad because you guys are warriors. You're the strongest people I've ever met. And I don't know how you could watch your kid go through this and continue to be as positive as you are. I want to thank Aunt Kim and Uncle Ron and my grandpa for supporting me and listening to me and keeping me laughing. And I want to thank my husband, DJ, for being there right when I got diagnosed, um, when we had only known each other for five months and kept riding this journey with me. And lastly, I want to thank all of you listening to my story and supporting me through this process. I really would not be here today without you. Thank you so much, Megan, for sharing that. It's, it's so wonderful to be able to celebrate that victory with you and to be part of that, that walk. As we are together, you know, sharing in life together and encouraging one another as we face things that are way beyond us, things that seem like such a huge giant, yet being reminded how big and powerful God is. Let's pull this small card back out from behind. As I look at the back of this card again, the stats on it were said, chosen by God, empowered to lead, purpose for good, highly valued. This is your card. This is you. Chosen by God. He gave His Son for you, empowered to lead, to lead others towards Him. Purpose for good, that's what God has made us for. And highly valued, how much more value could we have than that Christ would give His life for us? That is the good news, the gospel means good news. And as we face fears and anxieties, let us not forget that we have the good news. Let us never forget that the God we serve is greater than anything of this world. Let us never allow anything of this world to be closer than the God that we serve. 